and we had an in-person event. So uh, yeah, glad to see everyone here face to face, even though we can only see the top half uh, of our faces. Um, yeah, and uh, just a show of hands, how many of you, this is your first physical event for this year? Oh, nice, that's a lot of you. Uh, yeah, a warm welcome uh, to Google Developer Space. Uh, and just a, a quick introduction on who uh, the team, who is in the team. Uh, I'm Jiaxing from the Google Developer Relations team. So I take care of the developer and startup communities in our region. And Lawrence over here, uh, he's our events manager at Google Developer Space. I think uh, many of you would have seen him online uh, for the past two years uh, if you have joined uh, Data Science Singapore's online events. So yeah, really happy to see everyone here in person. Thank you for traveling all the way down after work, uh, be it from your office or working from home. And uh, a couple of housekeeping, uh, we do need everyone to keep your mask on at all times. Uh, so I do see everyone has their mask on. Uh, thanks uh, for doing that. And uh, yeah, except for me, I'll put my mask on straight after this. Uh, yeah, and shout out to Data Science Singapore's team for hosting your session with us here today. Uh, I'm sure they are no stranger to you, people like Ivan, Kai Singh, uh, Ku, Sanima, Raizal, I think you'll see them around later on. Uh, really happy to be hosting everyone here. And uh, yeah, before we begin our presentation for today, let me just briefly introduce what Google Developer Space does. Um, so we are home for developers and startups from around the region to learn and connect with one another. And we want to empower and connect the communities um, through our people, programs, network, and technologies. So uh, yeah, take lots of pictures while you're here today. Uh, I, I saw many of you taking out your mobile phones, taking pictures, uh, yeah, and do tag us as well. Um, we are on all these social channels. Uh, yeah, so on our website, uh, we update the events that we have, uh, and uh, we are also on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. And yeah, the next one, uh, Wi-Fi access. If you need Wi-Fi, uh, it's Google Guest. And if you need to use the washrooms, they are at the back of this space. So feel free to uh, use them. And yeah, now uh, I would like to pass the time over to Ivan, who will... Oh, no, okay, last slide, a uh, very important slide. Uh, so this is the building evacuation measures. Uh, it's very wordy, but uh, TLDR, if anything happens, look for me, look for Lawrence, follow us, we'll go down to level one. This is in case of an unlikely emergency. Um, yeah, so don't worry, you're safe with us, just look for us and follow us uh, on our way down. And yeah, last but not least, uh, Ivan, the organizing team for today, will be sharing more about today's agenda. Hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, thanks, Ya Singh, for the introduction. So uh, thanks, everyone, for coming down, despite the, the dicey weather we have today. I hope nobody's drenched. So we are running a bit behind time. I'm going to quickly go through the agenda. So from 7 until 7.40, we will start off with the basics of reinforced learn reinforcement learning. 7.40 to, to 8.20, we will have practical uh, reinforcement learning. And then for the last 20 minutes, or oh sorry, 10 minutes, we're going to have the Q&A. So I will quickly introduce our first two speakers. Uh, the first speaker, we have Tuya, who is a machine learning engineer. Tuya, can you uh, yeah, just wave your hand? So he's an experienced machine learning engineer who likes to create applications, build data pipelines, scale machine learning models, and move them to production. So he's also passionate about AI technologies, mainly in reinforcement learning, computer vision, and generative adversarial networks. So during his free time, he contributes to the tech community by organizing hackathons, conducting workshops, and uh, mentoring the next generation of elf developers. So for the next speaker, we have Kai Singh, uh, who's the VP of Machine Learning and Innovation at uh, DPS. Kai Singh, can you wave your hand? Yeah. So. He works at the intersection of data and product innovation. So over the last 10 years, he has led data teams in developing machine learning products such as deep learning, sentiment models, knowledge graphs, recommender systems, segmentation and targeting across industries like finance, media, jobs, e-commerce, and healthcare. He also specializes in interactive intelligence, designing, human, uh, designing systems where AI and human intelligence can 
coexist harmoniously and thrive. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker. Can we put together our hands to welcome Tuya? Thanks, Evan. Right. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming this evening. I know you have a lot of other things to do, but you decided to spend the time with us. So yeah, thanks so much for it. And yeah, my name is Duyat Cho, and uh, I'm here to talk about reinforcement learning. Like, uh, there's a lot of discussion on like speaker bio and stuff, but yeah, today I'm just here to talk about reinforcement learning. So don't don't worry about that. So uh, and I'm not a uh, active a researcher or expert in the reinforcement learning. I'm not using it for my work. So yeah, try to do a fact check before you know uh, you consume the content. So I'm trying to do my best, but it might not be hundred percent correct. Just to be sure. So, what is reinforcement learning, right? Uh, may I have a show of hands? Anyone heard of reinforcement learning before? There's a few. Wow, that's that's a lot. Uh, then um, I'm I'm I think the content I cover probably will be too basic for you. I'm sorry if if that is the case, but I will try to be you know. Um, more active and you know try to kind of give you some of the things that you might find useful for for that so in in a, in a nutshell reinforcement learning is just a part of machine learning method that you know you reward the good behavior and you sort of punish the one that you don't desire to do so instead of training from your past data you just let it explore so in, in reinforcement learning, we don't really make model and we don't call that thing a model. We call that an agent. So you, imagine you are like a toddler, try to learn things by interacting with the environment. So, so uh, we will expand that idea in a while, right? So first thing first, right? So there are different types of machine learning. If you're already aware of it, please bear with me for a while. So there are supervised, which you have the data and which you have the label. Right, so you just use label data, try to find the, try to approximate the function of it between the two. Right, try to find the causation. Then you have unsupervised learning, where you only have the data, you have not sure what's the label supposed to be. You try to find with the algorithm, give you the hopefully the best label or the correct uh, label possible. So in reinforcement learning aspect, right, we don't sort of like we don't really use data because we sort of learn from experience and our reward signal. So we try to find that reward signal so that we are doing the correct thing or the intended things that we are supposed to be doing. So there are some example. I'm sure you heard of uh, AlphaGo before. So this is like Go Chinese chess game that is played by Google and it beats the, uh, you know, some AlphaGo teams try to build the AI agent that can beat the world champion in uh, AlphaGo. And that was like a long time ago, right? So there are a few other things. There's OpenAI 5 that uh, if you play Dota 2, they probably heard of it before. This is totally run by AI and try to beat the world champion of Dota players. And they are sort of like coordinating each other to get the maximize their rewards to, to, to win the game. So there are like five agents interacting uh, as a team to win other five players. So those are like, very long time ago, like when I started learning reinforcement learning, it was already there. So, and, and there's, of course, if you are a beginner, you want to get started on it. There's some others, games or gym environment that you can test it on. So uh, in this example, like you're trying to land the spacecraft by just learning from the experience and make it go straight. So there are some tension, you know, how much force you need and things like that. How do you drive the car all the way past to the, the edge of the slope and things like that? So, so those are like early days reinforcement learning, right? And uh, recently there is this uh, AI that can drive car really well. And it beats uh, the, it is in the game by the way. So they try to beat the human that racing uh, against the AI and the AI beat the human. So the, the human was not like someone who just started as a champion in, in, the, in the game. Also, there's Agent 57 that came out. Uh, the agent that can play 57 games uh, really well. Right? It's not just one game. So then they are all even saying that this is like an approach to the general intelligence because you're trying to have this one agent that do 57 tasks very well. So enough of all the example, right? So 
how did this tie back to the AI scope? All right, so as we know, AI is like a big thing. Then inside of it, there's machine learning. So inside the machine learning, we have deep learning that we all love and adore and try to use it as much as possible. But it, it, yeah, so then there's the reinforcement learning, which is likely out from the deep learning, but there's some overlap. So the overlap portion, we call it deep reinforcement learning. So there are traditional reinforcement learning, and there's like using deep learning to solve some of the reinforcement learning tasks, which we call deep reinforcement learning. And for this talk, specifically, I will cover the traditional aspect. Right, so the next session probably cover that deep reinforcement learning. Okay, so for reinforcement learning, instead of having like, you know, colonial data, what we have is environment, agent, the state of each of the agents and environment, also the actions that agent can take and some rewards. So you do action A, you get some reward, you do action B, you get some rewards, then you learn from the experience and then you improve yourself. Also, there's one important aspect, which is time. So like you have to do certain tasks in a certain amount of time. So if your time is uh, limited, then you might not be able to do the optimal solution. So you have to be just, you know, like you are studying for exams. If you have a limited amount of time, you probably score an A plus, but if you have limited amount of time, you have to just dish some of the, an important chapter, you will just focus on that important chapter and then you move on, right? So whichever grade you get, satisfy with it because this is the optimal solution, the best that you can do within the given time frame. So this is some of the things that we'll be exploring. So if I have to give you an example, right? Let's say we have an environment here and we have an agent here, which try to interact with the environment and we have like time is zero at the time. Right, so agent can query state and reward from the environment. Then the environment can give them, okay, this is your current state. If you, if you are here, your reward is this, right? Then the agent can use this information, try to come up with the actions that, that give them like the best reward. So once the action is being executed back to the environment, it changed something in the environment, right? It, it may or may not change, but in this case, it changed. And then it gives a new state and reward back to the agent. The agent then can decide what to do again, right? So the actions keep coming back. So that's how they interact with the uh, environment. And also by using that, you sort of learn it, right? So every time you do something, you get it wrong, you get minus reward, you get it right, you get positive reward, then you sort of adjust your actions based on that. So this is in a nutshell diagram that I copied from uh, Sutan Bhattu. So this is like a very good book if you are interested to read, a Reinforcement Learning by Sutan Bhattu. So this basically dance down two slides into one, like very nicely drawn diagram. So it's the same thing, right? Like environment give you stay and rewards and then agent perform an action. Then once the action is performed, you have new state and new rewards for the agent. So the circle repeats. So, yep, so in a nutshell, agents achieve the objective that you want to do by selecting the best action possible with given the states, right? So these states, I do this, I get this reward, but I want to get the best possible rewards, not just any rewards that I can do. So, so this is pretty much summarize everything that I will be explaining throughout this entire talk. But if you notice the best action, right? How do the agent know the best, right? So it can be any actions, but what does it mean to be the best action to take? And uh, a lot of scientists have come up with this idea of marketization process. So it was done way ahead of our time. And this is like simple idea of, you know, try to frame that problems into a state environment, and then they try to chain it up. So the idea is pretty much simple. So this is like a sequential decision-making process. So it's like a loop, right? So in this state, I do this. In this state, I do that. And it can be used to decide the op uh, op optical or, or op optimal next steps based on the environment, states, and the action performed by the agent. Right? Uh, and it does using one assumption. It's called Markov property. So 
we are only assuming the next states is only dependent on the previous states and not the others. So um, I will give you some example about this, and uh, but hopefully after the example, probably give you a better idea of what it means. So if you're from math or stack background, you probably can read this uh, formula. So pretty much uh, the next states is only reliance on the previous states, not the entire history of the states from all the way to the start. Right? So your decision to uh, what you want to eat next, it doesn't depend on whether you are born in Singapore or some other country, right? So it only depends on your mood at the time. It's something like that. Uh, yeah, so this is some example. Imagine you are in a casino, right? And uh, you try to see the history of this ferret wheel. The so ferret wheel, if you don't know, there's like red and black that you can bet on. So if the ball rolls and then hit the black and then you sort of bet for the black, you get the money, something like that. But imagine the, the first three rounds is already black. What do you think will be the next round results? Anyone think it will be black? Uh, can raise your hands. Anyone thinks there will be red? Because, you know, due to the randomness, already three black, then the next one has to be red. Uh, or, or people think it's just 50-50. It doesn't care. It doesn't matter whether it's, yeah. So most of the... Participants are correct. I didn't get this right the first time. So I was like, no, it has to be black because you know it's a rig or something, right? But it doesn't it doesn't matter whether the history of it shows you that a lot of black or a lot of red, it's still 50-50 every time you spin the game. Unless it's temper anyhow, right? So so that sort of gives you some you know intuition behind the Markov decision, uh, Markov property, right? It doesn't have to depend on all the previous states only depend on the current states, and we are good with that. So, and of course, you need to work with reward, right? Don't just environment and states. So rewards, it sort of gives you like expected rewards. So if you do action A, your expected reward is 10. Uh, action B is five, something like that. So how do you calculate that, right? So you, you have to use some formula to calculate, and then uh, every, Travel like possible stakes that you can transit to should have tied to a reward. If not, you cannot decide, right? So you have to, your agent have to decide the best possible rewards stakes or action to, to do that. So for example, right, I could be at home and I could be watching a movie at the cinema, but I could be here talking to you guys. So, and the rewards for me is sort of give me three points in a way, it's arbitrary by the way. So I like to talk to people, connect with people. That's why I'm here, right? If my reward systems are otherwise, I'd probably be at home watching a movie, right? So it's, this is my agent. I choose the middle one because it gave me the best reward. So, so that's, that's how we frame the problems and rewards and the states all tied together. So, so generally is that. So you have a state, what state you transit to, how much reward do you get from it? So there are two types of rewards. It's applicable for our real life as well. Right? You have short-term rewards, which you definitely get after you've done it. And there's long-term reward, which you can only get it after a while. Right? Example can be eating junk food gives you like satisfaction right after you finish it, but after a while, it sort of give you like more health problems and things like that. For watching movie, make you fall asleep better. And you know, sometimes you can't really sleep because you're being watching some of it. Episode and sort of give you health problems from there. But for the long term, like saving money, exercising, sort of give you like don't give you the uh, you know in intermediate um, rewards, but in the long run, it's better for you. So we need to like frame this in that extent so that the agent is not greedy to just pick whatever uh, rewards that give him the best for that stage. It has to consider as a whole, right? Like what's the task, and then. I need to consider the long-term effect, not just the short-term effect. So yeah, I came up with this example, sort of similar like, so our agent in this, in this example is the mouse, and the mouse have two choices to make. Our goal is to reach to the cheese, right? And if we do wrong action, it reach to the mouse, it reach the cats, and then your agent died, right? So that's just pretty much uh, what I framed the thing. So we have the environment, which is the grid, and the action is moving left and right. You have rewards for each state, right? If you reach to the cheese, you get 10 points. 
if you reach to the, the cat, it's pretty much 50. So you sort of like don't get anything and you probably die from it. So from here, if I'm going to take the action to the right, it's only gave me zero rewards. Or if I take to the right, or the left or right, it gave me the same rewards. Right? So we need to come up with better problem framing because this doesn't give, this doesn't take me anywhere. Because whichever action I choose, it just give me zero, right? So they come up with this thing called expected return. So using that long-term reward in mind, they frame it into that. So this basically try to maximize your return by combining all the rewards as possible. So until you, from the, the position that you have all the way to the goal, right? How much are you getting it from? How much are you getting it from? So if I go left all the way, how much reward do I get? If I go right all the way, how much reward do I get? So this is the formula for that. It's pretty much just a summation of it. And then if we do that, right? So if I'm going to the right, I sum up all the way and it gives me minus 50. So I choose not to go there compared to my, my left, which is giving me 10 rewards. So I, as an agent in that environment, I know where to go. So I would choose the, uh, the left option. But this is only transparent to us because we know from like, you know, we are, we are 3D beings, so we see the 2D world is like this way. But if as an agent, as a 2D, you can't see, right? You can't see that kind of thing. So how do we model that? Let's see. Okay, so, so remember this slide. Uh, Say, so how do we know the best action? But we don't only need to know the best action at that stage. We need to know best action at every possible stage. So that if I ever get into one position, I know where to go. Not just for like, as of now, I need to know my future, right? So that if I move there, where do I go next? So they came up with this term called policy. So um, this is something like uh, distribution assigned to your action. So like every state, let's say in this case, the, the get the cheese example, it has two possible uh, actions that you can take. And then based on the rewards, it assigned the probability of the agent that should take that action. So, so left side has a positive reward. So my probability of taking the action for the agent should be higher than the right side because the right side is a diminishing return. So that's something like that. And uh, high, highly rewarding actions will have higher probability compared to the, the right side one, which gave me the low rewards. Right, so, so we use policy as pi in, in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in the mathematical or symbol way, right? And the pi initially, you can be choosing left and right. So these are like action table in a way. So you could choose left and right from these states. But after we have done some uh, calculations or train the agent, then the optimal policy should be always to go right. It doesn't matter where you end up. So the agent could be here, but the policy should tell the agent to just go left, right? You shouldn't, you should never go right because right has the enemy that will kill you. So that's something that uh, we have to work on. And the task itself, the, the task that I gave you just now, the get the cheese task is pretty much episodic task. So once it's done, it's done. There is no continuous, right? Like you reach the cheese, the task is complete, right? So, so these tasks are called episodic tasks. It has the terminal states and uh, pretty much similar to like Pac-Man, chess, tic-tac-toe, right? So all the games are like, most of the games are uh, episodic tasks, but there's other tasks, which is continuous tasks, right? So uh, if, you are, if you are building a robot in a factory, the, the task doesn't really end, it's, it's keep on going, right? So it's like uh, assembly line, stock trading never ends, it's go up, go down. And of course, learning, right? That's why you guys are here, spending your time on the evening to learn. So it, learning never ends, keep on going, right? So um, we can't just use this formula for continuous tasks because you never know when it's going to end, right? You don't know the T plus N. So it keeps on going to infinity, right? So you've got to do something about this. And uh, one way to fix it is by adding this uh, discount factor. So they call it gamma. And uh, discount factor is ranging from like zero to one. 
So if you are putting it zero, then you're only, you're very greedy. You only take out uh, the max reward that one states. If you're putting it one, then you are considering all the possible future rewards, right? So, so you have to balance that in the aspect. So you, if you are going to the infinity, the, the infinity part will be like very much to zero and you sort of like don't care about that. So this is like very beautifully done in, in the mathematic formula. So the gamma value is like zero to one and, and anything in between. So you can just choose whichever that works for you. So we, it's like hyperparameter tuning here, right? Try to tune that gamma so that you have the best reward policy and your model train faster. So in, in reinforcement learning, we train the agent, not the model. And the model terms in here is used for something else, not for the agent. And so that's something that will confuse you if you're from like machine learning or like, you know, like supervised learning, expert learning, the model means the function, but here is model. Model doesn't mean the agent. So agent is agent, the model is different. Okay, so I talked about policy before, but the policy only the table, right? But how do we evaluate which policy is the best? So imagine you are the mouse in the, in the story and you need to know the map, right? Uh, where do I go? The, the optimal policy is to always go left. So that policy is optimal, but how do we know that is optimal, right? So we, we can't know for sure. Uh, so they come up with like this formula to, to come out and like evaluate the policy between them so that we know the optimal policy. So the optimal policy is value function that we calculated and whichever gives you the highest return, right? So I calculate the discounted value over every states from my current states, whichever give me the max return, I will choose that path. So yeah, so there's these algorithms that uh, we use. It's called value iteration algorithms. It's, as its name sounds, it's key on iterating until you find the best or the optimal policy. There's like every iteration, it will, the values of this policy will get updated until it converges into like very small difference that we, we define. So uh, this is how it looks like, uh, although it looks very complex, but if you really read it, it's not that complex. And uh, all these terms that I use here is reference to the slides that I just list down, right? We have the rewards, we have the reward from the, for the next states with the probability of it, we are summing them up. So every policy, you will have an action table. So this states, state one, 10 left, state two, 10 left, et cetera. Then you just sum up all the rewards for each state, and then you have the policy value, right? You try other policy, maybe 10 left, 10 right, 10 left, 10 right, and compare their value, see which one is better. And whichever give you the highest rewards, because we work with rewards, uh, then you win. So the policy will be the one that give you the highest. Right. Uh, so before I go any further, anyone has any questions? Time. Is it time yet? Okay. <laughs> okay. Mm. So the next one will be the uh, hands-on, right? So I, I can't keep talking and never show you the code, right? So I also wrote some code to show you. Uh, you can, yep. I'll send you a link of this one, uh, it's, it's pretty much quite simple to, to write for, for this example only. So what we're trying to do is I expanded the, the formula or the, the, the environment into a grid so we can move up, down, left, right. And uh, this is pretty much just ground truth so that I, I know if if I ever do some mistakes, it will, it will alert me. So don't have to worry about that one. So the first thing first, we need to define an environment and the states, right? Now, before we start training the agent, we have to build the environment. We have to define the states and we have to define all the rewards and the action so that the agent can use the action in the environment to get rewards and learn. So that's what we will do. Right, so if, if you're familiar with grid system, so from, from this, we convert into this. So just a coordinate like zero, zero, one, zero, one, two, and et cetera. 
So what I would do is I just do that, right? From, from my code is the states, I define with a five, then high is three. Pretty much I create a tuple of those, the states and append to the list, right? So if I run this code, it should give me all the states, which is just a coordinate of the system, right? And then we need to define the rewards. So uh, I'm defining cheese as plus 10 and uh, the two cats as plus, uh, minus 10 to just make it easier. It can be arbitrary, it can be anything. It can be uh, one, two, it's up to you to define it. And so this is the reward that I would do. I define my goal state, which is four, two. I define my obstacle state, which is three, one and three, two. These are two cats. Then I just loop through and then assign, right? If this is equal to goal states, I give them 10. If not equal to goal state, uh, if equal to the obstacle, obstacle states, I give them minus 10. The rest is pretty much zero, right? So I define that. So now we have done environment states and also we need to do actions, right? So for actions is just upright, right? But if you notice, if our agents is here, only go can go left and down, cannot go up, right? Because it's the wall, right? And if we don't define it well, it might get stuck, keep going up and, and never come down. But not that it's really necessary, but to, to speed up the process, right? In, in real life, you probably don't know where the wall and surroundings are. So you probably just keep trying until you get it right. But uh, in this case, I know where exactly it is. So I just define all the possible actions that agent can take, right? Um, so now I have all the actions, all the uh, environment, environment rewards actions, right? Then I pair them up. So policy, it's so padding them up. Uh, padding them up is basically just to define at which states what are the valid actions that you can take. Right. So zero zero you can only take up down or up right. Uh, zero one is up down right, etc. So I'm just limiting it so that it's trained faster in a way. So before we send the agent to the environment, the agent has to know something. Right. I need to know where to, what to do first before I can learn. Right. So we have to define that initial policy or like action plan in a sense. So you have to give them some action plan so that they will execute the action plan, learn from it. Maybe there's some mistakes. I, I, uh, I bump into the cat and I die. So the next iteration, I learn from that. I don't go to that stage anymore, something like that. So the first initial one, we're just using random, right? So uh, we don't really know what works and what doesn't. So we just random twice from all the action possible for all the states. So it looks like this, right? So like uh, if zero, zero, you go right, uh, zero, one, you go up, down. This is not optimal at all, it's just randomized. So once it's randomized, uh, we sort of have to define our value functions. So value functions are pretty much from one state to the goal states, if I take this path, what's my, what's my uh, expected return from it? So I could be taking straight, I could be taking curve, I could be taking like, you know, zigzag. What's my expected return? So for now, I just uh, copy the reward states because we don't know any rewards yet. But uh, for this part, I basically implemented into the value iteration functions and I'm choosing gamma as 0 0.9. Uh, if you remember, gamma is the discount factor. And uh, I'm not putting any noise, but sometimes you probably need some noise to counter react for your environment, right? For example, if you are programming uh, a robot, a like cleaner robot, your floor might be slippery. So you need to cater for that noise into your program. So it depends on the, the ground, depends on your the motor function. So sometimes it might, it might have uh, some constraint in your a wheel or something like that, then you probably need to cater for that noise in, 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 a, in a building or training that agent. So this is actually the formula that I just shown you from the slide. And then pretty much what I'm doing now is I will just keep iterating through all the policy key is a state. So every states, I will 
I will choose a random actions and see there is, is something that is uh, better. So, so I took uh, action, like take left. I will compare the next time we'll take right, see which one gave me better uh, expected return. I will choose that. So I will keep doing that for all the states until they don't change anymore. So that, that's pretty much it. So because this is quite problem, so it's, it's pretty much uh, very fast. And uh, after I have done, I could print out the, the value. So remember, we defined the value of cat as minus 10 and the cheese as 10. But after this iteration of uh, all the calculating the expected returns for each states, we sort of get this kind of, uh, form, uh, this kind of value for the empty state, which we have zero initially. So the agent will have learned this value just by going through again and again and again and again to update the best possible rewards. So after that, we can come up with this kind of action plan. So the action plan for, for the agent at this stage is if you are in like zero, uh, if you're in this stage, you have to go down. If you're in this state, you have to go down as well. If you are on these states, you should go left. If you're on this stage, you should go left. And if you're on this stage, you should go up. So by guiding, by going through this action plan, the agent can arrive to the cheese successfully. So our goal is to come up with this. Then if you can, so once you get this, you can just use this as a map to travel around. Right, so, so our goal is to find this and like agent will have remembered this in their brain so that they know where to go. Yep, so if you are up to the challenge, you could try with more obstacles and see, try to block the cheese and see whether the agent can arrive to the cheese without having to you know, go through the, the cats. You could try with bigger environment. Currently it's just five by three, but you could try thousand and two thousands or yeah, whichever one you want to try. You can also try with having more goals, right? So we, I talk about the time being the important factor. What if the goal is too far away, right? And you are a mouse, so you can't be going around infinitely trying to find a cheese. So you probably have to find something else. So if you are having like time constraint, you could add that, right? You can add immediate goals to that. And of course, I talk about the noise, the floor being slippery. If the agent has 10% chance of reaching to the other states, right? So if you go left, it's only 90% of the agent reaching to the left, but it might slip out and reach the other states that which you didn't intend to do. So how do you frame that into our problems? And also like if the cats can move, so how, how do we do that, right? So yeah, that, this is something that, you know, you can try it out if you are interested. I will send this link or you can assess the link from here. Let me just quickly go through. So it's on, uh, maybe take a screenshot of this. If you're interested, this uh, RNMDB collapse. And you can, you can find that. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Uh, we have learned all this, reinforcement learning, MDB, reward, action return, episodic, continuous, policy, value function, policy evaluation, value iteration, and Bellman equation. So pretty much this is like two weeks in uh, university lecture, but you have learned in 30, sec 30 minutes, I think. Yeah, so that, that's pretty much it. And like where we are now, we're just like, just the tip, like small tips of the iceberg in reinforcement learning, which we will be exposing in the, future or like later session. And um, if you are interested to learn more, there's a lot of things that you can explore, right? Uh, multi color research, model-based, model-free, function approximation, uh, game theory, on policy, off policy, what are all these things? And uh, these are the resources. I think uh, on organizing team will share this slide with you guys. So don't worry so much about this. And yeah, thanks so much. And if you can, uh, Reach out, you can reach out. Uh, I think the questions, there should be a pigeonhole somewhere. The pigeonhole links in the question. We will do Q&A later together. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, thanks so much for your time and I hope it's useful for you. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you, Tuya.
All right, let's go to. Thank you everyone for joining us today. So I'm Kai Singh. So we have been running Data Science SG for eight years. So it's very nice that we can see everyone back, both uh, old and new faces. Last two years has been quite a tough time, right, for, for everybody. So it's nice. Okay, let's go on to the talk itself. Today, um, I'll, I'll try to share a bit more uh, based on what uh, Tuya has shared. Right? we go a bit further about how do we actually use it in the industry to, to what extent uh, that we can. Reason being practical, reinforcement learning itself right, is about five, 10 years away. That's what I tell my boss and everyone asks me as well, to be really usable by the masses. Think about like XGBoost, random forest, all these things that you're familiar with. Or even nowadays, like language models, all this, right? This, are, this is probably at the maturity. If you think about S curve, it's probably at the maturity stage. Uh, reinforcement learning is not near the S curve yet. It's really at the bottom, bottom where we're exploring a lot. So some of the questions, so you can see some of the links there, and then also uh, pigeonhole and post question. So some of the practical things is um, what it, it can be used for. Um, at the back of my deck, we will have some examples, mostly in robotics. So what we see here, mostly in factories, robotics, processors. And the reason we will go through, uh, as you go through with us this example here, you start to realize that for things that you can control in an environment, like a factory floor, a uh, very defined process, possible to do some reinforcement learning, you need to create an environment for you to create this state action reward, like what Tuya mentioned. If you want to do something like an investment, which a lot, a lot of like, I work in finance, right? So a lot of the boss are like, can you create a reinforcement learning portfolio? I can, I will not invest in it. I can give it to you. I will never want to look at it again because you'll lose, you'll lose money because um, there are a few factors. Number one is you need the entire team of reinforcement learning, PhD scientists, engineers to maintain it. And number two is creating this environment of state action reward. Like you see here, driving car or games, right? It's very hard. So there are two branch. There's one team that focuses on building the environment, and there's one team in building the, the algorithm. You need both. So this beautiful environment, we're, talk, we're going to talk about uh, parking a car. It needs to be created first, and it needs to be able to factor in the entire state action reward, the training thing, and be able to kind of grow together the algorithm. Imagine doing this kind of thing for uh, investment. You need to build an entire simulator first before you can have a nice reinforcement learning agent. That simulator, if you can build one, then you don't need a reinforcement learning. You just, if you can simulate the market for some got, got, uh, algorithm that you have to build a simulator in that scale, then you don't need, don't need reinforcement learning. You just own the market. So there's a lot of things to it. So there's also a question about from pigeonhole about poisoning. So the practical aspect of reinforcement learning agent we hear so far, right, it's very dependent on the reward function. And poisoning means that you purposefully uh, adversary add a fake reward to the entire reward function, thus poisoning the outcome. The defense of that, we'll talk about some of the things, clipping and some of the overseer things, uh, actor critic might come to play to, to, to solve it. So as we go along, we'll cover some of these practical aspects of it as well. So this is meant as a one and a half hour workshop. I, I will speed run it, uh, a lot of it. But the idea is uh, we'll talk about soft actor critic with hindsight experience we play in ML ops. So actor critic. So this is a parking example. So I want to park a car. So if I want to build a park a car model, if I tell you to build one using supervised learning method, big data technology, one way is to you go gather a lot of data about parking. You go to Europe and take a whole bunch of videos about how to park car in Europe. You take a whole bunch of car way to park car in Singapore, all over the world, because parking car under different conditions. You take three months to gather all the data you can about parking car because you want to build a giant supervised learning model using big data. That might work, but that's not how anyone learns how to drive. Anyone learns how to drive by number one, driving. Number two, you you go to attend like a school or a, 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 a trainer with you and then the uncle will scream at you, like, what are you doing? And you'll kind of park the car. So let me show you some examples of this particular agent in work. Um, bum, bum, bum. Okay, parking car. So we'll go into the, the uh, I need to go find a dashboard. Ah. Give me a second. Huh? 
this is too sensitive. Okay. So we're going to do a dashboard and we'll go through this parking example. So this is a simulator for parking and the whole goal is of course to park into the, into the box. Um, you have some physics in it and stuff, uh, but it's not like a perfect simulator because you see it's an empty car park. View all the other cars and stuff. But let's go through and see how the agent learns and we talk about how the various pieces come together before we go on to the theory of it. Okay, so step zero. So uh, each, uh, the size will be weird. You can see, okay. So at, uh, we define steps, each episode has multiple steps. So some keywords we will learn also. Uh, episode is basically a training. So this is one episode, right? one complete episode. Uh, the car drive all the way screen. This is initially the car have no idea what they're doing. So imagine you're, you're, you're driving like that, your instructor will be like, what on earth are you doing? Where is your eyeball? You look at the thing, you want to go to the blue box, where are you going all the way all, all off screen? So actor critic, I'm the driver, the, the agent is the driver. There's a critic layer, a critic, the instructor scolding you. What, what are you doing here? Look at the eyeball on the blue log, go towards that, that, that thing there. So actor critic is two layers of uh, deep learning uh, network working together and the critic will validate what the actor's uh, score is. So you see as we go further through the episodes, it's getting a bit better. I mean, it's, it's still going off screen, but it's pretty stupid still, not nowhere near, near where we want it to go. But let's, let's slowly see as we step through it. Right? So. Okay, as you step through, right, what happens? They start to recognize something along the, the car park area. At least it's, it's trying to stay within a car park area. Let's see this one. This one is still driving like a wild man, okay? Bad example. Okay, let's go. Okay, okay, we're getting there, getting there. So it's getting some sort of reverse. So this is somewhat like what, it's trying to reverse back so badly, right? So it went out of the screen, it's trying to reverse so badly, but it's timing out because it's taking it too long. So what we see, so for the first time it succeed. First time it succeed, it managed to reverse in. So it's learning from its mistake. The actor critic is playing along with each other. So there are two layers talking to each other. And as we simulate this process, it gets somewhat better and better. That's what I was to sharing. Basically based on the score and policy, the policy is getting better and better. And you see that the car, now, now, it, now it learns speed because the faster it arrives, the better score we give it. Less, not really fewer, but the speed is one of the factors for good reward. So it's driving like very fast to get to that, that point. And also take note that the blue box and the starting location of the car is always random. So it's not, it's not like learning a one, uh, one way to drive, it's learning a policy to react. So that's the difference between that and a normal supervised learning agent. So now you see it's kind of doing uh, quite well, quite fast as well. And it's able to do a variety of, of, of angles. So that's quite important. So you can, as it grows more and more mature, you start seeing that it always hits the mark quickly. So that's one of the, the beauty of kind of this general AI kind of lucky thing, right? Instead of giving a bunch of rules and, and, and having one model, it's reacting to the situation it's placed in. And it's very important. And that's one of the key strengths of reinforcement learning that cannot be easily replicated in like supervised learning or other traditional methods. Okay, let's go. Okay, so. Today we'll cover a whole bunch of stuff, but the, so you can think to deep dive into that back later and all the, the code, everything is there for, for you to play with. But we'll focus on the conceptual building blocks. We won't be going to specific algorithms and to, as in, we will touch the, the algorithms of course, but we won't do the deep dive into any specific algorithm. I want to give you the conceptual stuff and if you're interested, you can always find out more. So about me, I, I, I managed to kind of my career span across a variety of, uh, of different companies. And I think the, one of the interesting thing was, okay, so I also, with Cool, we actually started AI, uh, AIP as well. So Data Science SG is kind of like free event for everybody. AI, AI Professional Singapore, we do certification, we do a bit of paid events. So it's more of a professional body of the Data Science SG. You can take a look at that. So what, what spent me interested uh, in reinforcement learning was the games. Uh, I watched StarCraft for the past 10 years. And first thing that Alpha Star came out in 2019. And this is the entire paper, the link there, I got an article talking about it. The is that it's able to deal with this real-time system. Real time is important because a lot of our world exists in real time, not just the MTP world. MTP is kind of like the static version of the world. A lot of things if you want to use it in healthcare, you want to use it in robotics, you need to deal with things that happen in real time against 
the environment or against some adversary. In this case, you're commanding armies and stuff. More importantly, you're looking at various neural network activation, decision points, and the entire entire kind of tree of it's, it's okay. neural network and plus reinforcement learning together, right? It's no longer a tree-like structure, but we, we, we tend to kind of visualize it as various neuron layers and, and neuron tar each neuron layer will try to kind of explain it by it's targeting a specific, for example, it's a building layer, it's a unit layer, uh, uh, controlling the, 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 the unit attacking layer, things like that. But it's not that clear cut, but either way, so we have all these various pieces come into play. Most importantly, you see, right, for supervised learning, you will never reach professional level, never, uh, because it's a real-time strategy game, because there are a lot of factors. But for reinforcement learning agent, you reach basically the top, so grandmaster and above, above for the MMR is basically uh, top 1% of humans. Uh, you reach Mana is a player that play against the, the AI. That is about superhuman level, 0.1% of the human race. Um, the, the alpha star can reach this, this superhuman level. And it does that by a combination of playing against itself and also studying how humans climb the ladder. So humans get better by playing against its, him, its himself or herself. And more importantly, learning from experience, number two. And number three is kind of to combine different strategies. You don't do the same thing. You do different things in different combination in reaction to something. And all these are reinforcement learning attributes. So you, you can think of it as you build a supervised learning on this wouldn't make a lot of sense because you need all the data of all the players that ever played. And you still can't ma match the, the best player in the world because they, they have that innovation flair. They have that particular style. You need to be able to gain that, that, that X factor, so-called. And supervised learning kind of is always looking backwards. So that's always the, the issue with some of this. Um, uh, it becomes still a bit of rule base and a bit of like hard to catch up with professionals. So hence this, this thing, right? Uh, you see a lot of AI products out there. I'm doing AI. So all these software company vendors, behind the scenes are ifs. So I am in the fraud space, right? We, we do a lot of vendor, vendor talks. All of their AI products is all a lot of rules, a lot of if statements as foundation because that helps to frame the problem. And then they'll do their fancy algorithm on top of it. But why don't you just start? Certain problems, maybe you want to start just from the reinforcement learning approach. So it's kind of like a third way of looking at the problem beyond supervised, unsupervised. That's the, that's the gist of it. Um, again, it's many, many years down the road. So I'll accelerate some of these things. But a, a side track is basically, I, when you see, so this was trained when I was a student uh, at Georgia Tech. And one of the things there was the beyond human level. The now, now you see all these crashes, right? It happens a lot for DQN, but nowadays the I'll share today will, will take away some of this instability and you will have this beyond human level plateau up there. Consistency. One of the scariest and most powerful point of reinforcement learning is once they get to that superhuman level, you'll always be superhuman. Think about all the alpha star, alpha go, which is why it's exciting. It's rather stable, surprisingly, once it learns how to do a certain job well. And uh, this, this article is talking about once you reach a uh, human level, the average human level, it doesn't take long to reach your Einstein level and a whole bunch of Einsteins talking to each other will create this, this entire super AI thing. We are maybe not in, not in our lifetime, maybe in the next lifetime, perhaps. But most importantly, when you're doing this kind of work, you will see that you have no idea why it works. You have no idea why it doesn't work. So it's, it's very bad. So the, the, that's why we try to have more talks like this to share about the, 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 the process of looking at it and have at least some understanding, not just being code monkeys. So you see, his agenda is quite packed, but we'll just go straight. So um, this is my, I have, a, I have a girl, so a baby girl, and the baby will let the baby explain to us what's reinforcement learning. Um, so for her, right, when she start eating, there's no concept. So it's a very common problem of, of reinforcement learning. There's no concept of eating. But how do you actually get from here, all these questions to, to a definite, more, more structured questions, right? What's yummy? What tools do I use? So that's what, that's what the two you mentioned, right? Environment state action. This environment of eating to that, to that thing on the right where you talk about memory, you start storing knowledge about the actions you can take, the results of it. Attention, how do you focus your attention on eating using the tools? Imagination, being able to kind of 
go a few steps further than what you have seen before. So all these are concepts that are very important for uh, kind of practical uh, RL. It's all about repetition, all about feedback loops, and all about the policy. Again, what Tui mentioned, right? So those are the, the key of it. So TX power will skip, same thing as what Tui mentioned, have the greet, greeting, try to have this policy. Uh, this is the formulation that uh, for temporal, this captures the temporal difference and the state action reward Q learning. Long story short, right? When you want to update uh, a value, so we call it a Q value, right? Reward is given at each uh, action you take. So in this case, you want to escape the T-Rex. A negative reward is you get eaten. 100, negative 100 points reward immediately. So that's bad. Uh, you escape into the into the safe area plus 100 points. So that's an immediate reward. But it's discounted. So that's where the temporal difference and all this come in. Discounted because you want to build an agent that will learn not just to avoid the T-Rex, not just to get to the exit, but the entire pathway to avoid the T-Rex and get to the exit. The journey is important. More so than very much more so than the the outcome actually more so the learning, hence the this thing is crafted such that you have a learning rate where you update your value. So remember the, the we want to space store value in the grid, right? Your old value is updated with a discount learning rate based on how fast you want to ch change and the typical learning rate for supervised learning. Same same concept with a discount factor of your your future value estimation. So based on based on what what happened, you will get closer to T-Rex, higher chance to get eaten, or get closer to your exit point, higher chance to escape. So all these will be discounted and added to the temporal part of it, and this will be basically added, added to the Q value. So Q value is a capture, it captures the reward, short-term reward, long-term reward. That's what value function means. The, the wiki is actually very good, so you can say it's a wiki link, so they'll explain the whole thing nicely. In, in code, it's actually not that bad. The code is actually a literal translation of what you just seen. And nowadays, later, we'll see the, a lot of the functions. You don't even code the Q, Q value out anymore. You just call it like a, a secular like that. So we'll talk about that later. Okay, some challenges we need to get through these pieces. These pieces will help you understand a lot of papers and a lot of the, the work that's been done in the modern approach. So again, we need, it's a bit uh, abstract, but when you put it together in the code, you'll see how how this works. Doing greed doesn't solve anything. I mean, it's a very good uh, tutorial to get started, but doing greed world doesn't solve real world problems. Hence, we need functional approximation. We cannot calculate every single greed score, not possible in the real world. For example, in Go, there'll be like billions of stars equivalent, billion upon billions of combinations, not possible to fill up the greed. But in the supervised learning world, we know how to solve it. We use uh, a model to represent, uh, let's say you want to build a fraud system, we don't need to have fraud data for all the combination. We can have a fraud model, a best fit model to represent fraud in general for this particular kind of fraud, for example. So similar concept, we build a functional approximator to approximate what will happen if we take the action without taking the action. So we use some of the things that we learn along the way as the robot drives around you pick up some of this reward function, things like that, the reward value, update Q value, and then we do a functional approximation and we focus all on the loss. So a large part of oops, large part of the models are about this loss function, how to op optimize it. This is very old code. This is like many, many years ago. Now, now then cleaner ways to write it. But long story short, there's optimizer and we try to uh, kind of reduce basically the, the loss function based on the difference between our functional approximator model and the somewhat the actual value that we can we can derive from we have seen. So that's one functional approximator helps you scale up. Exploration exploitation is nothing new. A lot of the models, uh, supervised modeling model does it. Um, so more importantly is um, how do you balance it? So the epsilon decay is a typical, again, from supervised learning world, epsilon decay, uh, things that will have this temperature thing where you start off exploring a lot and then you eventually exploit your knowledge to, to be able to run it. So there's this probability thing that will, will based on the will change over time. So at first, the probability of taking a random action to explore is very high. And over time, you become uh, less and less random. You kind of be able to do the actual actual uh, action, that the most optimal action. So 
this part is the so cute, so dumb face, right? You see it's crashing, it's flying all over the place. It's like not doing anything that's useful, but it's actually learning and building up the ammo, building up the knowledge. Then it's, it goes to the tipping point. You always see that. And then you have this beyond human level and you can see the robot is landing uh, better and better into the thing. Same as the driving, right? It gets better and better. So that's the exploration, exploitation. Um, dueling is important. So we talk about Q value, right? Q value, uh, it's uh, it balance the long term, short term. There's also a huge concept of advantage. So you see all the recent paper talk about advantage. All the recent algorithm use advantage. Advantage is the advantage of coming to the meetup today versus staying at home. So the advantage you gain today, hopefully, is knowledge, fun, friends. Uh, so all these are positive things versus staying at home and being depressed, sad, and by yourself, things like that. But you get to have a nice meal at home, things. So that's trade off. So, so advantage is against your next action, other actions, other options. So advantage is a very interesting concept because it now compares your not just the long shot reward, but this reward against other rewards that can could have taken. And you'll be surprised as you optimize advantage across the network. What we what I've seen before is you can take a disadvantage position. And that happens in AlphaGo when they explain why AlphaGo wins or even lose with Nisado. You take some very strange, silly moves or not, in, not efficient moves so that you can gain the advantage 20 steps down the road. Uh, this particular seat that you place, this particular move that you play can be used to your advantage. So, so it's a long balance, the long-term thing, but also kind of balance the, the other trade-off, the other moves that can branch from this. So that's a very important concept. Okay, so advantage calculated like that. And advantage, uh, code-wise, again, is very simple. You just play up the view, the value, and uh, find. So you can see that actually back end, again, you don't implement advantage anymore. Nowadays, you just call it. Back end is not that hard. Back end is just spitting up. There's a lot of math to prove that it works. The, there's a lot of, of concepts behind it, but the actual code itself is not, not super hard. And that's what I'm trying, trying to bring across as well. When you bring everything together, it's, it's super hard. So don't 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 try to code uh, reinforcement learning algorithms from scratch. You'll die. So use a package. Yeah, I'm just telling you this. Are, this is how it works, lah. So you know. Now experience replay very important. Experience and all this that we mentioned. Uh, the experience replay actually get a bunch of uh, batches of experience so that you can train your your model. For example, car. Parking a car, I want it to learn how roughly to deal with situations, to move backwards, uh, to, to, to turn the vehicle. I do not want it to, to remember the whole sequence because this sequence will almost never occur again in the real world. It will always be slightly different. I mean, for those who have seen people park car, even like, like park, or drive yourself, right? You, you'll never get the same situation. So spin out the mini batches. And also later we'll talk about some other more intelligent way of using experience is very important. So experience itself is a asset that you must fully utilize. And there are many ways to do it. And we'll learn about hindsight experience later, which is very fun. Okay, almost there. So separating and double. So again, these are keywords that you, you'll hear a lot in the papers and the, the methods. Separating the target layer and uh, having a separate target layer and value layer. We will see that image later. And having double Q network to kind of uh, one to generate and one to select the action. Uh, this will help with some of the adversary attacks as well. So um, this one actually improves the performance by not overfitting your, 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 your single policy. So you have two layers. Actor critic, for example, is, is one. Okay, so the, the purists will argue with me that double and it's, it's different with actor critic, fine. But actor critic is one way you can visualize having two separate networks. One, one person scolding you to drive better and you drive rather than overfitting everything to just one network. I'm the driver, I'm criticizing myself like a madman, scolding myself, why am I not parking it correctly? That doesn't make sense. So having multiple layers of, of network working together, is it protects the, the, the integrity of the, the model better. So one of the question was about poisoning. If an adversary try to poison your reward function, having multiple layers, double Q network, separate target uh, network will help. Reduce feedback loop and protect your, your, your training better. Okay, we are ready. Uh, do you feel ready? Yeah. Don't worry, don't worry. The, the, the reinforcement learning is something that you go again and again and again. It, it, reinforcement learning, to learn it, is like reinforcement learning process. You, 
you'll look at it again and again over the next few years and eventually you'll get a bit hang of it, hopefully. Stable baseline is the succulent candidate. There are tons of candidate. Again, it's like Wild West. This is, think of it the days before succulent. Think of it the days before XG boost. Think of it that before whatever was a TensorFlow or, or PyTorch, before all these things are invented, how messy it was. There was no NumPy, there's no, no Pandas, okay? I came from that time. So before all these things were invented, this is reinforcement learning stage. Nothing is standardized and stable baseline wants to be one of the standards. We'll see how it works uh, a few years down the road. Okay, I got apparently 10 minutes to finish finish up. Let's go. Okay, so, da, 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 da. so later the, again, the slide, the first link will have all this. Let's talk about, so this is a collab code, right? So remember to, for the runtime environment, remember to set set your uh, GPU. Get started when you install the package. We'll go straight into the hindsight experience we play and, and her. So how do we teach a car to park itself? Some questions here. Um, realistically, right, the, so parking is a, we call it a go condition continuous task. You basically need to, just continuous action behind the scenes is way more complex than your usual MDP already. There's a, you need to basically teach the, the, the model to run, to drive, there's an angle, there's acceleration, everything. There. So it's quite a nice simulation of the real thing. And then we have this entire dashboard that I'll show, show later. But one important is understand her. Okay, so experience can be used in many ways. Hindsight experience replay, replace your experience. Think of it as the baby, uh, actually my, my kid was learning how to eat. Now the problem with a lot of reinforcement learning agent training in the real world, and I've seen that is it's very sparse in the sense that there's very, very few success. Your parking will take forever. And it in fact cannot be solved until recently because things like this, you only get points when you park, but it's very hard to teach someone to park a car, like teach an agent to park. Even a human to park a car takes like months of training to park a car. Imagine teaching an agent, uh, which is a lot dumber than a normal human to park a car. You know, you'll take forever, very expensive. Hindsight experience replay breaks down the problem to say that I will give you a reward even if you go backwards. So the you, you start breaking up the parking into multiple steps. You go backwards, you turn, get closer to the parking spot, weave into the parking spot, and then you stop and stop and park there. So maybe a few five or six steps. So hindsight experience replay is saying that uh, why don't we each of these checkpoints we reward we, we set it as the goal that we wanted anyway. So we have a now we have a timeline, right? We have an entire timeline. Um, let's say this uh, agent only managed to reach backtrack. It went forward, it would crash a wall, do all those silly things. It managed to backtrack towards the goal one time. That one time we set it as the temporary uh, goal that we want to achieve. And everything that happened before that will now be scored based on that goal. So in that case, you get some, you don't get a lot, but you get some feedback that, okay, that is a positive example. You, you can work the negative example as well. If you crash into the wall, you set that as a negative goal. Crash into the wall is a terrible idea. Crash into the car and humans, horrible idea. So those, those can be kind of meet, also part of hindsight experience as checkpoints. So what happens is by, by breaking up your timeline, into chunks and then you and then training each chunk as a mini goal you start to be able to build this uh, repertoire of experience that ultimately helps you park the car and this problem can be solved and hence nowadays there are more advanced version of uh, hindsight experience this is like the first version of it um, and in fact if you see the code is like just there are only three options and three options and two of which is, is absolutely stupid there's only one option effectively uh, you either use the last last uh, state. If you crash into the wall, that's the last state. If it um, just go random direction, that's the last state. Final is a terrible idea. Uh, episode, you take a random random situation. You don't care about timeline. You can take things that happened before. Absolutely stupid idea. These two in the paper, it doesn't work at all. They're just trying to push for a future, which is you maintain a timeline and you take something that happened in the future and you look hindsight, hence the name. You look backwards, everything that happened beforehand is parked under this checkpoint as the steps that you wanted to reach this, uh, this, this goal, this, this kind of like uh, in-between goal. Hence, hence hindsight experience replay. Ooh, I got five minutes left. Okay, so uh, yeah, so the, that's uh, 
so one of the, why, why am I explaining all this? Because this is like the foundation for experience replay. It's very hard to kind of conceptualize it without someone talking talking through it with you. And even then you go home a few times and then you still, you still struggle with it. There's an entire thing about uh, SAC. I want to share about clipping. So basically this is where we talk about learning two things, right? And also entropy. So this part is important. So the clipping is something that has been introduced like a few years back again, more advanced version now. But the idea here is that the, we talk about having the double layer, uh, uh, double layer uh, neural net that kind of like one create the value, one create the 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 target. What, what how you want to solve the problem? Clipping is introduced to say that we don't need to fix them; we can swap them around. So basically, this is saying that this helps prevent overfitting again. So instead of having two nets that is two nets that is kind of fixed in their in their roles, you swap them around. You allow them to kind of um, play different roles based on your training. And that's a very good, that's a great idea. Entropy is uh, used in like decision trees and things. So entropy is introduced as a noise factor. So priority, like measure of priority. So at the start, we want, we want to say we have very high entropy or chaos, do anything you want. And as we go along, we decrease the entropy layer. So that's the, remember we talk about the, how, how it balance the, the exploration exploitation. So entropy is a modern approach to it. Again, there are, there are even more modern approach than, than what we see here. This entire formula, and this is what I mean by having two layers. On versus off policy. So you have a behavioral policy. This is where your, your optimal policy is go left, go right, and each of these will have a score. What's the best thing to do? And it's a target that ultimately maps what is what you should do in each. So by having two different policies, this is known as the off policy approach. By separating them out, number one, you is a bit more resilient to some attacks because now you have two policies that check each other. And number two, some of the modern approach, they, these things can swap around. So the, 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 mod, the, the agent can kind of learn more diverse actions and things like that. So there might be other modern approach that has multiple, multiple layers. So, but yeah, that's the main idea of it. Okay, we have four minutes. Da, 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 da. So, okay, so the entire code is here. So actually, you can just run it and you can train it. I'm going to show you is actually, it's, it's quite um, clean in the sense that, so all this is the TensorBot thing that I'll, I'll show you later. But the model itself is like that. So they build it such that it's very familiar to those that use, we use Scikit-Learn, we use TensorFlow, all these models, right? It's pretty much just, you call a function, you put in all the, all the parameters. Below, I got the Optuna that talks about how to hyperparameter tune tune the all this using TP uh, tree Parsian estimator, okay? So TP thing. So for those who are interested in hyperparameter tuning, go, go below, uh, look at the third part of it. And we, we won't have time to cover it today. So anyway, so you see it's pretty clean and then it's pretty much just uh, uploads everything for the scores and you go to this ML ops thing. And let me find a way to close this, this close button. Huh. So so this is a, uh, you can use any any ML ops. Uh, the the one, that, one that B actually integrates directly with the with the package we are using now. Hence the just yeah, just keep it easy to see. So it has the the outcome of it, which is important. But you can see the success rate. So over time, what we want to see is this flat line. So things that we one shot for, like the flat sign at the top is telling me that it has hundred percent success rate as you reach about 200. 200 you start having like almost hundred percent success rate. So you can have early stoppage actually you don't need to train 400. So 200 is good enough. And episode means and stuff. So so you can see, you want something like this as well. You want something that uh so negative means it, it crash and stuff. Uh, for this particular problem, you can't get getting a zero is the I think a perfect solution. So getting a small enough like this number that's like negative seven is good enough uh, for this particular problem. Then another thing I want to see is also the length mean. And so for each episode, right, you want it to be short, especially for this kind of parking problem. You don't want to go around in circles. So you want to see that the, this thing is falling and it stabilizes. So it doesn't go in one circle. It just goes straight for the parking. So again, it's problem specific, but this is how you read, read this kind of chart. And of course, global steps should just increase that. I mean, this is number of steps that goes over time. So having an ML ops platform like this tracks all these pieces as well as the they have all the, the setup, the, the, the whatever resource is used, and also your model is safe, things like that. So again, it's, it's important for, for reinforcement learning agent in particular, because you want to see all these various pieces. Hmm. And I have one minute, yay. So Q&A is after this or? 
after this, uh, okay, so I can wrap it up quite quickly. Um, so that's for the this part. So each of these have some references in Go for the documentation. PPO is interesting because the yes, it has multiple uh, use case. So uh, for PPO, you can exploit further on yourself. It's an algorithm that I call it kind of like the baseline for everything in RL. You can run anything in PPO. The OpenAI was using PPO as the baseline algorithm for quite a couple of years because it can run in anything. You can run robots, you can run driving, you can run uh, like all sorts of uh, algorithm. And unfortunately, we don't have time to kind of go through all these details. You, you can take a look at the notes that I have here and then you can uh, ping me if you have any question. They focus on advantage. So they use advantage to talk about policy. Again, this is another way to counter poisoning effect by keeping track of the policy delta that you are training between the new and old policy. You clip it uh, using the advantage advantage formulation and value. So all this formulation is just trying to keep your delta change in a small controlled manner so it doesn't go go totally off the charts and totally go, go crazy. Poisoning occurs if, let's say, I want to force your, I, I am jealous of your car parking thing. I want to eat to crash all the time. I want to kill all your customers. So I was, I'll put in the reward function that such that I trick it to think that crashing will give you a lot of reward. So that's poisoning. So clipping, uh, advantage clipping will prevent that because you cannot suddenly switch from a, 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 a parking agent into a crashing agent. The difference is too big and then clipping will stop it from happening and will flag out a whole bunch of errors and stuff. So that's one way to that modern approach can also prevent such uh, such adversary attacks. Okay. All right. Yeah. Over time, one minute. But yeah. So last part is the the, the, the last part. I can check the the hyperparameter tuning yourself, the optima. And if you're familiar with TPE or you're not familiar with TPE, you can can, can talk to me as a tree based parser estimator. And yeah. So this one actually optimizes all the parameters you see just now. Uh, yeah. Okay, so that's that's a very fast. I also the actually beyond the workshop, right? The you can check out my last part where we talk about the usage of it. Yes, someone is coming to kick me off the floor, is it? So last part is the deployment challenge and all the all the various uh pieces of that that why it's like five ten years away and how is it used in the real world? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, we'll do a quick Q&A now. Uh, we take probably, give, I think given the time that we have, right, we'll take about two or three questions. Uh, anyone has any questions, just raise your hand. Okay, hold on. Uh. So uh, when you ask a question, just keep your mask on, okay? Yeah. Okay, thank you for the presentation. So it was very awesome. So my, I have a very common question about um, data set. You mentioned in the beginning of a presentation that we have to collect all car parkings around the world, in Europe, in Singapore, in other countries. But to be honest, me, like a, I am a driver, I don't need it to do it. I don't need to travel all, the, all over the world and just look at all car parking. I just need maybe two, three of them, just to understand conception. And then I can go to the other country and just park with, with no problems. So is any ideas how we can just switch from this classic approach of collecting as much as possible data to some new conception? So this is a question. Thank yeah. So the what I presented just now, right, the SAC hindsight experience is to solve that problem. So the whole point of reinforcement learning agent is you don't need to get all this data all over the world. You generate this data. So how StarCraft, they managed to play StarCraft, they managed to play Go, how that agent managed to park the car is by generating its own labeled data by running it through a simulator. So whatever you see that's happening here, right? So it's true that we didn't feed any data. We, we didn't tell it anything beyond the state action reward. So this is literally what Tuya presented, right? state action reward function. That's all the, the, the agent knows. And it learns how to park a car just by trying to optimize its reward function. So in this case, it learns to go backtrack to, to get to the, it doesn't understand parking at all. It doesn't, it's not fair with any additional data. It just learns that by doing this thing, I get the most reward. That's all I care about. So, so the, this is the modern approach indeed to solve uh,
problems like this and it's used in some of the self-driving car applications they're using this concept together with some of the supervised learning method like computer vision and all this to supplement it uh yeah but the in this way we don't need to do all the collecting all the data yeah but by using reinforcement learning so so i have some experience with like training this kind of model so if you forgot to like in implement some of the rules let's say you ask the agent to just drive straight away right like you just keep on the road keep driving front if the car is on the other side of the lane it was kid do that like keep driving out but it's wrong right so you got to find out all the rules to implement it so that it doesn't violate the traffic rules and different countries have different traffic rules right sometimes it drive left sometimes drive right so you got to train all these rules implemented inside the model so that it will it will really well with it yeah. excellent yeah excellent point yeah so the rules definitely this one is like no rules one this one it does everything you want but the rules are important as well to kind of like quantify it yeah. Yeah, questions here. Uh, okay, uh, try to go one by one. Top one, uh, expensive. Uh, hello, all right, one question. Okay. Hello, yeah. So, my question is like initially, you mentioned that there is a difference between an agent and a model. Uh, can you explain that? Okay, so, so in reinforcement learning, the model sometimes refer to the environment, like what's the model, your environment state action rewards. And in Q learning, if you see sometimes they convert, like so you don't really see the entire environment, you only see some states and some observation. But in some other problems, you don't really see the states, you have to guess it, right? Like you don't know, you are in a blind, try to drive in night or something. So if, so sometimes uh, we, we imagine model in the reinforcement learning, we use the learning model in like you know in some aspect to to guide the agent to do certain things. So in that in that way, you will call model agent. But whatever I did previously, I wasn't training anything, right? So it was not model that I trained. So it just try to find that uh, policy plan by going through one by one. So that's not really a model, right? Yeah. So how that explains it. Okay, so some very good questions here. Uh, actually, I try to cover a few more because the first one, uh, the answer is uh, there's no. Okay, the, the, I explain, right, the biggest challenge of RL is how expensive it is to set up the environment, how challenging it is. There's no way around it. You need to have a very, very sophisticated and good environment. Maybe there are some experts they can, can correct me, but as far as I understand, I've seen, there's no way around it. It's expensive. Um, the OpenAI team spend millions, billions of dollars to build their, their StarCraft and, and model and they try and monetize it through healthcare nowadays. But yeah, it's expensive and both in terms of hardware as, as well as the talents needed to maintain it is crazy in, infeasible. Give it five or 10 more years. Yeah, it, it, yeah you, can't, you can't use it. There's also one very good question about the search. Uh, I thought about it. So when, 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 when I was doing in my even in my, my school days, how is it different from A star search and things like that, right? So it's true it's a search problem to a degree, but um, A star cannot park a car. So there's a limit to what all these search algorithms, computer science theories can do is the, it's very defined, uh, let's say defined distance problem, uh, shortest distance. But even then, you know, all this dextra and all these various pieces have a lot of limitation in the real world where there are traffic, where they are, you need to react to crazy drivers. One guy was cutting my, my, my car just now. Another guy flashed the high beam at me while I'm parking my car. So crazy drivers like this, you cannot a star search it because they'll just assume perfect condition and crash in. So reactionary is something that differentiates RL. So you also have to cater in the real world, your car can go die like 90 degree turn, right? So a star probably go that. So you have to Advocate that in this. so the car go this way in a curve direction, but not ninety degree. Go ahead. Oh yeah. <laughs> so some question from the the YouTube is like can cultural learning contribute to our policies? Can uh, read paper. Uh, read paper. Yeah. <laughs> there are beyond there. Are, there are, I seen before, but I can't remember. The, the I go find some and, and, and post it later. Yeah, but. Yes, possible. Yes. Yeah. 
but I forgot, yeah. Uh, so monitor IR, like, yeah, show ML ops, use the ML ops thing, similar to that, you can monitor the thing. Uh, second, I find agents have learned the rules. Ah, so the interestingly for StarCraft, in eventually they started off trying to feed a lot of the StarCraft rules as well as the player history. In the end, it doesn't matter, they just play against itself. So the again, the modern approach for IL is it, you don't need rules, you don't even need to know what game you're playing or what, what, what is, how it works. The, 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 the scary part is it doesn't know how it works. It just knows it has to win, regardless of whatever it does. So the, the IL agent play against itself and just train its own mind to solve the problem without knowing the problem. And that comes with a lot of uh, issues. You want to deploy it in, say, healthcare and all these things where you need explainability. You cannot explain IL easily because it fundamentally doesn't care about rules. It just cares about reward. Uh, how you optimize the rewards. And hence, I think three hours sharing, agent can play like 37 games, how many games, right? It doesn't matter. They don't care about rules, they don't care about how it works, as long as it reached the goal for them, yeah. Okay, uh, I think in view of time, right, we'll stop here for today. Um, so first thing first is uh, a round of applause for the speakers, please. Uh, and also to Google Developer Space team for uh, ha having us, hosting us. Thank you very much. Okay, um, and also to all of you as well, uh, we didn't expect such a large response actually after COVID with the physical meetups and all this. So uh, a round of applause for yourself, please, for coming all over here uh, for the Arts Science History uh, meetup. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, the speakers will still be around. You can still ask them questions, but please remember the safety measure I can't remember what the other M stands for. Never mind. Anyway, uh, you all know what, what the SMM stands for. Um, so one more thing, I just wanted to remind, uh, let you all know that the next meetup right, is also physical meetup as well. It should be on the 22nd of June. So do mark your calendars and do join us if you are available. Okay, so thank you very much for coming and uh, hope you have a good evening. Thank you.